Welcome to everyone this morning. I hope folks are having a good morning. It's good to see those that we have out. Um, I just made some more copies of the Lesson 2 uh, question sheet. If you don't have a copy of that and would like one, uh, we're going to be starting in those today. And then I don't know how long we'll spend on, on these. Um, we spent quite a while on the intro lesson, but I think there was a lot, kind of just a broad uh, overview of topics to cover in that one. So if we go a little bit quicker through these, that's okay. Um, we probably won't make it to the first side today, but that's all right. Um, but before we begin, John Sandusky is going to open us in prayer before we start our class this morning. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We're thankful for this uh, day that we have, like before the, the night's rest that we had, um, also for the uh, rains that we're, uh, we had last night. And, uh, we pray that you will continue to uh, bless us in, in every way. We thank you for this uh, uh, morning that we have uh, to gather uh, freely and to uh, peacefully uh, do so, to study from your word. Pray that you'll be with uh, Andrew as he uh, leads us, and we're grateful for the efforts that he has made to organize for the class. Pray that you'll bless all the teachers uh, in the other classes this morning. Pray that we can find the uh, messages you have for us, things that we can apply uh, to our daily lives. We pray that you'll be with those of our number that uh, cannot be out today uh, for uh, reasons of health and suffering or pain and uh, or those who are shut in. We also are thankful for those who are able to be out um, amidst uh, those uh, those pains and the encouragement they are to us. We pray that you'll uh, look down upon our worship this day as we've gathered here to, to praise you for the great God that you are and that you'll be happy in everything that is done here this morning. We ask calls to your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, we ended the discussion last week with looking at um, just one of the thought questions, which was why we think this study is important. What do we hope to gain from this study? Um, and what, what emotions come to our minds when we think about a study of the Holy Spirit? Are we anxious? Are we confused or fearful or excited? Maybe a combination of several of those. Um, and I had a comment brought to me last week which was, we were talking about the inspiration of Scripture, and this being the next topic that we're going to be covering. This is probably one of the first things that people associate with the Holy Spirit, and probably the most frequent thing that, especially us in the church here, associate with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's kind of the most concrete of the Spirit's actions. It's the easiest one to put a finger on it and say, you know, yeah, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But, and the person I was talking to was saying, you know, when they first became a Christian, they, they understood it, that the Holy Spirit, you know, gave inspiration, but that there were other things that the Holy Spirit could potentially do or other uh, benefits of having the Holy Spirit. And this person said that their first instruction was kind of a bit of, oh, no, 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 it's, it's just inspiration. You know, just when you think about the Holy Spirit, it's just the inspiration of Scripture. So there's even active, there's even the active effort sometimes to tamp down other roles of the Spirit. Um, I don't want to do that in this course, but I want to start with maybe something we're more familiar with and something that we've, we've probably studied before. Um, so that's why I wanted to start here after our introduction. And when we talk about inspiration, um, whether it's in a sermon or in a class, I think it always winds its way to 2 Timothy chapter 3, more or less. So I just figured we would go ahead and start there and get it out of the way. So 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, um, we've, all, we've all read it a lot, probably, many times. So Paul is, is talking to Peter. He's sending him this letter, encouraging him and helping him to be, he uses the phrase, a worker approved by God in chapter 2. And in chapter 3, he, in verse 10, talks about following my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch. So it's, it's admonishing Peter, uh, excuse me, Timothy to be equipped. And then in verse 14, he starts, 
Um, I'll just start in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Um, my ESV has a note, by the way, that on the word whom, knowing from whom you learned it, is a plural pronoun in the Greek. So knowing from whom, knowing from the multiple people from which you've heard it, or possibly other entities. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay. So, the familiar phraseology, all scripture, uh, most translations may say, is given by the inspiration of God. The ESV happens to translate it, is breathed out by God. And if you've ever looked into the, the word that's used there, it's probably something that you've heard brought up before. It's a unique word in the Bible. I think it only occurs in this location, and it's a compound word in Greek, which is basically the word God and the word breath together, um, usually when it's translated Holy Spirit, you have the word breath or spirit, and you have the word holy. Well, here it's kind of like they got squished together and turned into a compound word. So it means God breathed or God, God spoken, God exhaled, God wind, um, depending on how you translate those words. Only occurs here. So the first question I posed, which is maybe not a great, I, I probably didn't phrase it very well, but how is this description of scripture breathed out by God, did you find any parallels to the way that the Spirit is described? And we talked about some of the descriptions. I didn't wheel out the board today, but when we were talking about the characteristics of the Spirit and even the names of the Spirit, some of the words in Hebrew and Greek that, that describe the Spirit, um, do you see any parallel between those? It speaks about um, the Holy Spirit coming, uh, at verse 13, but when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not um, speak on his own initiative, but he, whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So, I mean, he, when you say God breathed, we think of that, you know, speaking. Right. And so I think the Holy Spirit, as we are on our list, he speaks to us. Right. Yeah. Grace, you have a comment? I mean, it's really almost a verb form for the noun that we've talked about already, which is Spirit of God. So, I mean, it's the Spirit of God is a, a, a noun that's used to, des to describe the Spirit's I don't know, the, the name that we use, a, a name that we use for the Spirit. And then this is the verb form, really, of the same concept or same words, God and breath or breathed. Right. So, I mean, it's just kind of interesting that the one who is identified as the Spirit of God is also the one whose, one of his roles, at least, is to breathe out the the Scriptures. So... If, if you're interested in the Greek, the word is neustos, P-N-E-U-O, no, P-N, I can't read, P-N-E-U-S-T-O-S, -E neustos. It's where we get the words like pneumatic, pneumatic drill, or a pneumatic-powered um, piece of equipment, something that's air-powered, basically. Um, so the compound word that we're talking about is the word for God, theo, and neustos. So usually neustos just appears anywhere that the spirit is mentioned. I, I just found it interesting that basically the word, almost the words for Holy Spirit are just mushed together and turned into, like you said, a verb. Um, so if there, was an, if there was any action that could be easily attributed to the Spirit of God, the breath of God, it would be breathing out Scripture, as Timothy says here. Um, and then to, to the point that Chuck made, we described that the Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of Truth. Uh, the Spirit is knows the mind of God. It is 
knowledgeable about the things that, that God has to say. So Paul, when he says that the Spirit is profitable, and all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it just speaks to the accuracy and the, the reliability of the Scripture. Um, and also thinking about the, the words that the Scripture is valuable for. The, valuable, the Scripture is valuable for teaching, uh, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, completing us and equipping us. Um, a lot of these things probably sound familiar when we were talking about the roles of the Holy Spirit, the things that the Holy Spirit can do for us. They're, they're listed out in this passage here. Um, one, one thought I came across in 2 Timothy 3, I can't remember if I, who I read this from. When he says all scriptures, what is... What is Paul talking about? What's included in scriptures? I mean, primarily when Paul writes at this point, he's talking about the Old Testament. I mean, there are probably a few letters that have begun circulating through churches <clears throat> by this time, but for the most part, he, he has reference to the things Timothy learned, probably through his mother and grandmother and Paul and others from the Old Testament scriptures. So, But, I mean, we have other passages later that would include other things, the one I can think of is in Second Peter. Peter re references Paul's writings and, and makes the statement uh, that they twist some of those difficult sayings of Paul as they do also the rest of the Scriptures, which, which lumps Paul's writings together with the Scriptures as the, the Jews would have known them. So, but primarily in Second Timothy 3, he's referencing the Old Testament. And, and you don't have to make that inference from looking at the root words. It's not really contained in the text here, but it's just a conclusion based on the, the Bible hasn't been compiled yet as we know it. Not all the letters have been written. So if Paul is referencing back to scriptures, it has to be at least that which has been written up to this point. Um, but also I appreciate the reference in Second Peter. That was one that uh, I hadn't, uh, hadn't noted. So there is reference in the New Testament to contemporary writings of the apostles also being lumped in with Scripture. Um, so that's, that's a good inclusion. Jim? Yeah, that what's included in that all Scripture, that's from A to Z, jot and tittle, all links in the chain. It's a double -L, it means all. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and and there's, there's some passages we'll get to in the Old Testament that reinforce that notion of all or the totality of the words being important. So, um, yeah, good thoughts. Any other thoughts in 2 Timothy? I know we cover this a lot, but sometimes there's other things we can pull from the text. That they're God breathed and they're useful for these things, but there's that purpose there, and I think that's so important for us to recognize and, and to put it to use in our our lives. Right, and the fact that it's there's a continuation. It's not just the scriptures inspired. It's dropped in our laps and it's over. Um, you know, within this very passage, could be a way to talk to someone who may say, "No, it's just." It's just the Bible being given. That's the only role the Spirit fulfilled. Well, if we've just described God breathed as the very act of the Spirit, and it's so that we are taught, we are equipped, we're complete. Um, there's, there's more to the Spirit's working that's not just words on the page. So good thoughts. Second Peter 3, 15 through 16. I'm close to there, so let's just read that real quick. 
Verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some of these things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. So the reference there for Paul's writings being included in scriptures. Um, And throughout the New Testament, I think some of the stuff maybe we'll get to later on, or if we don't, I'll make a note of it. There's, There's plenty of other references to New Testament writers saying, you know, what I'm writing to you in this very letter is not of me. This is not my ideas and and machinations put down on paper. And, uh, you know, I often say, I say this a lot when I'm, when I'm up here, I'll say, Paul said, if I'm reading from a letter from Paul, or I'll say, he says, you know, speaking of whoever wrote it down, oh, you know, Paul, Paul says here, or Timothy says here, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit, but think about that. Okay, 2 Peter 1. We'll go on to the next question here. What I want to start getting into is a bit of a discussion of how far does inspiration go? And this is something that there is disagreement on among, among religious people. Second Peter 1. Could I get someone to read 16 through 21 of Second Peter chapter 1? Thank you. For we, did, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. <clears throat> This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy or scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy has ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoken or spoke from God. Okay, thank you. So there's there's several things here uh, that are reasons why the words of the apostles are confirmed or why they are assured of their message. What were some of the ones that you heard uh, listed here in 2 Peter? I can think of maybe four. Witness, okay. So eyewitness account, they saw the things firsthand. Uh, you had the eyewitness of God uh, providing testimony to the faithfulness of those he was uh, working through. Right. So in the ESV, it talks about the utterances that they witnessed. So not only witness to Jesus in the flesh and Jesus in his works, there was witness to utterances or a voice, a voice of God proclaiming those things as true. Good. Maybe four was too many. Maybe there, maybe I just see three here. The last one I see, which is what he spends the rest of the passage on, is the prophetic word. And it's actually that one. Uh, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, so confirmation of prophecies, as a lamp shining in a dark place. 
So he, they describe the, the confirmation of prophecy is a lamp. The confirmation of prophecy is light. Uh, light gives clarity. Light gives understanding. It gives knowledge. So that as well is a part of confirming the things that they said, the things that they saw as being true, and they're citing this as, you know, we're writing these things not as we're following this. We're, we're writing these things as we've seen it from God. Um, so this, this passage then also gives us a little bit of insight into, at least for prophecy, um, in the context of the passage, what, what that process maybe looks like a little bit. Um, verse 21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So let's spend a little time on, on that notion, because there's a couple of different there's a couple of different ideas that people have tried to explain this by. Um, does the spirit possess someone so that they are not in control of their actions and can only serve as a, a dictating hand? Or does the spirit tell words and the person retains their consciousness and writes them down? Or does the spirit give ideas and the person puts it into their own words? I think... Um, I think some of the variances between those different ideas are somewhat inconsequential. Um, and I think one of those ideas, there's, there's probably idea within Scripture to say that that's not the case. But what do, what do folks think about the mechanics of inspiration? And here we go stepping into, let's explain something that's completely unexplainable and, and the Holy Spirit working divinely. Let's, let's pretend that we can do that for a bit. What do people think? saw Dan, and then, and then Brace. But John's right here, so we'll, we'll let Brace go. Sorry, Dan. Well, I was trying to find the exact reference in 1 Corinthians 14, <clears throat> but it's pretty clear that the Spirit did not possess them so as to essentially take over their person. Um, there's a verse in... 1 Corinthians 14, where essentially it says the spirit of the prophets are under the control of the prophets. There it is. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 31. He's talking about the need for them to do things decently and in order, and he says, For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So the point that he's making is they're still they still are in control of their faculties the spirit hasn't so overwhelmed them as to essentially possess them the way that demons did and cause them to do things they don't want to do but the other thing that seems pretty clear from passages like the one we just read in second peter is that the spirit gave them the exact words to record so it wasn't as though the Spirit inspired them with the message and then left it to their own de devices to figure out how to word that. The, the words can be trusted as the, the breathed out words of God and not the words or interpretations of men. But then as a, you address in another question, it's also fairly clear as you look at the differences in the writings of Isaiah versus Amos versus Paul, that their personalities were still used somehow by the Spirit right. to, to convey that message. And so the Spirit allowed them to be their own unique person, so to speak, as He used them as a vessel for presenting the message, even as you alluded to in the question, or uh, I don't know exactly how it was worded, but used their own personal experiences and, and allowed them to make self-referential statements mm -hmm. in the things that they said. So, I mean, it's, there, there, there's a whole complexity to this process. But what seems clear to me is they were not possessed or out of control, um, but that the Spirit still did, while using their unique persons, 
um, gave them the exact words he wanted recorded so that we can trust that what we're reading is not Paul's thoughts on what the Spirit told him, but the Spirit's words through Paul. So, question. What are your thoughts on what happened to Balaam? The prophet who opens his mouth to curse <clears throat> Israel and all he can do is bless Israel. Well, he seemingly, I mean, obviously he was, he was money hungry. Um, but he, st he still seemingly wanted in some way to, it, it was almost, I don't know, to me, I view Balaam as someone who is trying to ride a fence. Um, he, he wants to do the will of God. He sees the benefit of following the, the God of Israel and speaking the words of the God of Israel. But at the same time, he wants what he wants. So he wants the money, but he can't figure out how to get it because as, as long as he submits to God and opens his mouth as a vessel of God, the message is always bad for Balak. So, um, the, so there seems to be at least some willingness on his part to be a vessel Therefore, the Spirit uses him, but ultimately, his willingness to be a vessel for God does not serve his own purpose. So he finds a different way later by causing the, the women of Moab to commit sexual immorality and, uh, and lead the children of Israel into idolatry. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's how I've reasoned through it. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, um, but uh, I, I think it's a possible explanation that's still consistent with all the other aspects we've talked about so i don't know that's that's the best that's the best stab i got at it yeah dan had a comment i don't want to hold him waiting i didn't i didn't look back at the reference but doesn't it doesn't balaam say something to the effect of i can only speak what what god commands me to say so even though his motivations are i really want to be able to pronounce the cursing that balak is paying me to say um he does provide at least the warning so there seems to be some indication of there has to be willingness to, uh, there, there has to be an, an invitation to the Spirit to, to be inspired or to take down the, the breathings of God and write them down. Ben? Well, I was just going to say, this is kind of one of those areas, um, I've used the phrase before, the devil's in the details. We could sit there and argue and, and get have heated discussions about how prophecy actually worked and how the men were inspired and everything. We just can't explain it, and it's it's not worth the effort to try to delve into it and get to the at the most minute detail on how this happened, because it it does not, you know, we we have to take it by faith that it's, that it happened and and just live with it. I mean, there's a lot of details I would love to have, you know, the, more than just you know what happened in you know, Jesus's life before age 33. Besides that little blurp, and when he's about 12 years old. I'd like to see, you know, I'd love more detail about that, but there are no details provided, so why, why, why uh, get overly concerned about them? Yeah, yeah I, ultimately, I, I don't want to try to cast doubt on anyone's surety that the, the, the Scripture is inspired. We know from our stance, from where we're standing, the end product speaks for itself as an inspired work. Um, and, you know, I think you're right that if someone is not, if someone is given the words to write down and they write them down of their own free will, but they follow what the Spirit tells them to write exactly, is the end product any different than if the Spirit does take over someone and, and cause them to write only exactly what God wants them to write? Um, at that point, you, you can hardly distinguish between the two scenarios looking at the end product because the end product is the same. Yeah, you got a comment? Okay, I'm going to make one stab at it here. Um, all the parents in the room, it probably had the experience of a student in their family with an assignment to write some material, some research or something. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about the role of the Holy Spirit and his breathing the Word of God, this does not set aside all the other characteristics and roles of the Spirit. Many of those writers who, even at the time of Jesus' death, were still in a state of confusion and still in a state of, um, what have we just seen? Uh, still of a mind of, how do I reconcile what I believe to be natural law with what's occurred around me? Uh, who clearly uh, still wanted more guidance and Jesus knew they needed more guidance. That the role of the Spirit as both comforter 
and aid or and bringing assistance, you can see that if you don't exclude those other roles, uh, it would be illogical to assume that it was a uh, a manifestation of the spirit that excluded all of the personality, all of the concerns, all of the thoughts of the writer. Because we again, we've seen the end product, as has been mentioned. We know that there are distinct characteristics within these texts which help us to see the personality of the writer. So you have a student with an assignment, and they write something down, and the parent says, well, that's good, but what do, have you thought about this? Um, that's, that's kind of as off the mark of what we talked about or what you've learned so far. So maybe you want to take that out and maybe you want to put this in instead. And only because I know that the Spirit has those roles of bringing uh, comfort and, and help to these individuals, I can see it as a collaborative effort so that in the end, the Spirit gets to say what he wants to say anyway. <clears throat> but it, it wouldn't have been done in a coercive way because you would have seen that in the writing. The fact that you have the personality coming through, if the person felt as though they were being compelled to write at things they didn't understand or things they didn't necessarily believe in, you've seen student work, or some of us have, that's a train wreck. You've seen these papers where you go, well, it's clear <clears throat> that mom or dad tried to take this paper over and they didn't do a very good job of it. Or you've also seen those papers where you go, well, that kid had nothing to do with this paper. Everything here was written by the parent <clears throat> because you know the parent, potentially. At least, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> at least I've seen opportunities to, to see that at work where a student's work is not the student's work. So that's why I think it's in our best interest to remember that the Spirit was also trying to win these fellows, also trying to convict them, also attempting to help them fill in the blanks all the time that the scripture is being revealed to them. Those other roles are still important. So I think that's why we've got the end product we do, because it wasn't an either or. Just because it was God's word being breed, he doesn't cram it in anyone's mind anymore for the authors of the scripture than he does us. Right. I mean, if that, was, if that was the way for us to become Christians, then why do we need the Bible? God could just send the Spirit. He could come in and pound everything we need to know under our heads, whether we want to accept it or not, and just move on to the next one. Yeah. Hang on to the mic for just a bit. So a couple of things while you were saying that that caught my attention. You mentioned the idea of conviction, and I think I, you'd made the comment in a previous class about conviction is something that needs to be you got to be convinced in your own heart. The person has to let themselves internally be convinced of the things that they believe by faith. Um, and the Spirit, I believe, helps with conviction. I think the role, one of the roles of the Spirit is to lead someone to conviction. Um, the other thing that caught my attention was it, the idea of competency. We read the, what the scriptures have written down and we see competency of the things that they're talking about. No one would question that Paul fully believes and knows what he's talking about. But there's exceptions to writers who were competent. Um, and God tells them when that's the case. When God tells some of the prophets, I'm going to tell you this prophecy, you write it down, but seal it up because you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. This isn't for you. In that instance, there's, there's an explicit directive from God that you know, they know, okay, I'm not supposed to know what this means yet, um, but they still wrote that down. Does that, do you think that's in line with, um, did I hear you right? Well, I, and I think too, when you had those revelations of the, of the old prophets, uh, when they were told to seal it up, it was always because the manifestation was going to be hundreds of years in the future. This is not going to impact your life. This is not relevant to you. So I want you to seal these things up. And there's going to be a generation that's going to go, ah, oh, we've got the key to open that seal. We've got the knowledge and we've got the, the observation to say, we had better be paying attention to that which the prophets left for our benefit. And the difference being, when the Spirit is revealing the mind of God in the New Covenant, it's not sealed up for a next generation. It's a very current, relevant topic. 
So I think God could easily have told these writers, hey, this isn't for you, don't worry about it, this is for another generation. And some people believe that's what Revelation says. However, the book itself says absolutely the opposite, about 12 or 14 or 17 times, right. depending on how you count them. So uh, for that reason, I think God makes it clear, the Spirit makes it clear, if this is for the current generation, you're going to know it. If this is for a future generation, you're going to know that too. Good thoughts. So the, so the Spirit leaves room for the personality of the writer. The Spirit leaves room for the competencies of the writer to be evident. Um, one more point in Second Peter while we're here. I, I came across this in some of the things I was reading. In verse 20, knowing first of all that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So for hundreds of years, the doctrine on this verse and this was primarily put out by the Catholic Church in its early history, the Catholic Church said that this verse tells you that don't try your hand at interpreting prophecy, only the Church can do that, and the Church will tell you what, what it means. Um, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for prophecy was not produced by the will of man. So what would we say to someone who, who might use this as, point to this verse and say, Oh, you can't, you can't decipher the scriptures without intervention. You can't decipher the scriptures without help. How would you approach it? Whether from this passage, I think, it's, I think there's a possible angle, or perhaps from other references. I'm sorry, this wasn't in the questions. I just sprung this on you. Okay, so Jeff said that Scriptures do not, are not self-contradictory, so Scripture can be used to explain Scripture, and all of that is available to people. I think that's good. Grace? Well, verse 21 really explains what he means by no private interpretation. Because he goes on to say, for, so he, because, um, no Scriptures of, of, of someone's own interpretation, because, I'm using a different word, but same meaning. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. So, I mean, the basic idea is they didn't interpret what the Spirit's message was and write it down. They were carried along by the Spirit to write what the Spirit wanted written. So it wasn't their own thoughts. This really has less to do with our interpretation or deciphering of what the Scripture reveals than it does what the writers were doing in the process of pinning it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is not a great passage to use to make a point about the need for others to help us. I mean, there, that, there may be passages that deal with that, but this is not really that passage because it's dealing with the idea of inspiration, I think. Were there other thoughts there? I didn't see any other hands. Oh, Dan? I think it talks about the unity of the of the revelation to us uh, that in Galatians and when Paul says, you know, not, neither we nor uh, angels, but you know, don't accept any other gospel except you know, before, beyond what you've already received, because it's just, it's not another gospel. So if Paul was to take off and, and if, uh, you know, and do what his own thing, or if Peter actually did the thing that the Catholic, things that the Catholic Church says that he did, then yeah, maybe you know, that we could see where that was incorrect, completely incorrect. But no, if this is um, the inspiration brought forth one unified message, and that unified message you can, like I said, cross-check against itself, like Jeff says. So you can, so it's the, inter the per private interpretation is, uh, you know, why do we have, I don't know, 5,000, quote, Christian churches out there, you know, denominations out there when we don't have the one revelate, revealed word, so that's when people are taking it's not an interpretation it's a their own uh, view on things they're taking their own 
thoughts and making them making them uh, uh, making them I guess you say Ray religion mm -hmm. right Chuck's got a point I think as I was reading this um, what I see is that it's talking a lot about the production of prophecy not the product of prophecy the production of prophecy writing it down that process is not by someone's own interpretation um, but the interpretation of the, the Catholic Church is that the product of prophecy also is not open to you. Um, and I don't think that's what's spoken up here. Chuck? Could we not use um, Ephesians chapter 3 um, in verse 3 and say, uh, Paul writing that by the revelation therefore made known to me the mystery as it was written before, and by referring to this, when we read, you understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it was uh, been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets and spirits to be specific that the Gentile. Yeah. I think, I think that's an excellent place to go, that there were hidden things, there were things that were mysteries to the previous generations, um, but that those things are, are laid open and revealed with the completion of the prophecy, with the completion of the Testaments. Um, I was trying to think about what would it look like if somebody makes a prophecy based on their own interpretation. And I was trying to remember, I came across, I can't remember if it's in Jeremiah or Ezekiel where he talks about, or maybe it's, it's earlier in the, in the Old Testament, but he says, basically, if there's a prophet who tells you something, just kind of wait it out. If it doesn't come to pass, you know he's not from God. And when we think about prophecy by one's own interpretation, you can, you can give it your best shot to say what's going to happen in the near future, you know. Sports analysts have a job for a reason. They, they're paid to give it their best shot and try to predict what's going to happen. Or um, I don't know if that's what sports analysts actually do. Is that what they do? But um, tell you who to bet on. But um, <clears throat> so you know, we, we see examples of that where someone tries to make a prophecy on their own interpretation. But that's not where the prophecy of God comes from. That's certainly not where the prophets of the Old Testament came from. They were 400 years prior to Christ and writing about you know, his, his tunic not being ripped when he was executed. That's not something that a sports analyst could do. I don't care how much you pay Shaquille O'Neal. Well, I was going to add that everything has been said has been very good. Um, this was written by Peter at a time when others were making a valid attempt to write scripture. And uh, it wasn't just a handful. It was, there were plenty of folks willing to make a stab at it. I think that the difference is in our generation, we have to go back to maybe Joseph Smith or Mary Baker Eddy or someone like that. You don't have that many people attempting to write scripture today. Those folks did. And as you just said, all you got to do is give it a few, give it a few uh, weeks or years and you go, well, that's not really very helpful. Uh, and so this was an active uh, threat. This was an active, uh, ongoing enterprise at the time Peter wrote this. People were coming up with their own interpretation of Scripture. Yeah. yeah. And he equates the way that the prophets were inspired. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. That's, that's a pretty explicit way of pointing out that this is not their work, this is not years of their study put into practice. This is something that was directly from God, and he's equating their work to the work that they're putting out as well. That's why he's saying, we were witnesses, we heard the, the utterances, we saw the signs, and we are speaking to you from the Holy Spirit the same way you would trust the prophets.